la la la. My name is Thomas and today I'm tinkering. Actually, you know what? This car is way too cool for my standard intro. My name is Thomas and today I'm tinkering on this brand new 2021 Aston Martin DBX. Please do excuse me, whenever I stand in front of the DBX, I feel just a slight stiffness coming on. Oh yeah, it's my neck after driving this car for a week. A massive thank you to Distinctive Collection, the local Aston Martin and Bentley dealership here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Go and show them some love using the link underneath the like button because without them, this video would not have been possible. They were kind enough to lend me their only DBX here in the city and only one of a few in Canada. My first ever glance at the official DBX was thanks to these two photos. The first thing to run through my mind was Ford had given the new Escape to Lincoln and they just made a fancy Ford Escape. And it's funny because I remember a few years ago when the new Ford Fusion came out that everyone was saying that it just looked like a crappy Aston Martin. So I guess in a way, history has repeated itself. However, I'm no longer looking at a photo anymore. This is the real deal. And I gotta say that in person, the proportions are far better. This is the first year of the DBX, the 2021. And I think how they've configured it with the black on blue exterior and blue on black interior just makes the world of difference and now that I've seen it I can't unsee it and I'll never like a DBX as much as one that's set up like this. The luxury SUV segment has exploded in the last decade with the likes of Lamborghini, Porsche, Maserati, Jaguar, Bentley and most of the rest joining in and now it's Aston Martin's turn. So what is it that makes the DBX so special and sets it apart from the competition? Let's just say that I'm over the moon that Aston Martin has invested in building a proper SUV that can hop up on a curb like this absolutely no problem instead of creating something like the Aston Martin Signet, which is exactly what happened the last time they strayed from their supercar roots. It was almost quite literally a Toyota IQ with an Aston Martin badge and a couple of fancy pillows. It was also the only car in their now 108 year history that they've made to be classified as a city car. And believe it or not, for one reason or another, almost a decade after their official release, the Aston Martin signets are still holding their value. Let's just hope that the DBX does the same thing. Speaking of which, what have Aston Martin done to make this a noteworthy vehicle in this new era of super SUVs? When I first saw the DBX in person, the first thing that caught my eye was the fog light because there's more going on here than you might think. First of all, this is an air duct. So this is what cools the brakes. It reminded me a lot of the Hellcat because this is also your indicator. At nighttime, when paired with the main LEDs, they come together to create a look that I think is an instant classic. Now this is the classic Aston Martin grille that we first saw on the DB2 prototype in 1949 and this is the normal Aston Martin logo and you're probably wondering why I'm bringing them both up. Well, they are the biggest ever on an Aston Martin. This because, well, I mean it's an SUV, but the logo, fun fact, the bigger the Aston Martin, the bigger the logo gets. So because this is an SUV, we now have the biggest Aston Martin emblem on the DBX. But this new New Aston isn't all about just being bigger and better, it is also setting several firsts. It's the first Aston Martin designed to be able to go grocery shopping, which I did, and yes, I still parked miles away from everyone else, just like you should in a car that costs this much. It's also the first ever Aston Martin designed to be dog friendly, to go adventuring off road, and the list goes on. And lastly in the front, these vents are not just for show, you will actually see heat seeping out of them after a good drive. Most car manufacturers have to deal with making a vehicle left-hand drive to right-hand drive and vice versa, and they move over all the components. But Aston Martin has left one thing on the right-hand side as a little nod to the fact that they are based in the UK, and that is the hood latch. Let's talk about engines. Fun fact, Mercedes just acquired a total of a 20% stake in Aston Martin, which means it's in their best interest for the DBX to perform well. So they gave them a little bit of a helping hand. This is a hand-built 4-liter twin-turbocharged V8 from the Mad Scientists over at the Mercedes AMG division. It's set up for 542 European horsepower and 516 pound-foot of torque. It's pretty much the same engine that you'll find in a number of insane Mercedes AMGs, and since I think Mercedes makes some of the best engines in the world, I am happy as can be. 
To complete the Mercedes powertrain, it is also mounted to their nine-speed transmission. A nod to where this engine comes from is this name on the engine. The Nissan GTR does this as well. Of course, it comes with all the tech that you'd expect, this having cylinder deactivation and a number of other things, but something that I just find funny is that because the engine is so big, they've had to put the battery terminals back here and the washer fluid on the other side. And I'm a big fan of the clamshell hood. It gives you a really good divide, sort of like a mullet. It is business in the front and part Party in the back. You have all the AMG trickery happening in the front and then the Aston Martin refinement in the back. And it's all good talking about the engine, but there's no fun unless we start it up. This is Mr. Glynn. He is the manager here at the Azaridge Estate Hotel. And since he was kind enough to let me do my shoot here, and by the way, this used to be some dude's house and they changed very little to make it a hotel. I said that he could be in charge of showing off the exhaust. Start her up, Jason. All right, give her hell. Now that was just GT mode. We're now gonna put it in Sport Plus mode and try that one more time. Give her. But if that still wasn't enough, here's what a cold start sounds like. And a drive-by. And the best part of all of this is that this is just the stock exhaust. There is an exhaust even louder than this, but the reason that it's not on the demo version that I have here is because when someone's taking it out for a test drive, they wanna be able to hear themselves think. Making our way to the back of the DBX is a few things you'll notice that are a bit off. First and foremost, and I think this has got to be my favorite feature, there is an Aston Martin badge here and a tow hitch down here. That's right, there is a tow hitch on an Aston Martin. I think this just got to be about my favorite thing in the entire world now. It can tow 6,000 pounds, which means it can not only tow another DBX because they weigh 5,000, but that's only a few hundred pounds less than your average mid-sized truck. Next is around the exhaust, there is this cool design. I know it's quite polarizing. I personally quite like it. And the third thing I wanna to touch on is the rear window. It's missing its rear wiper. So what Aston Martin says happens is the air comes down here underneath this window wing and then brushes any debris you have or water off of the back window. And that's fine and dandy unless it gets wet while you're stationary and then you can't see anything behind you. That only kind of works when you're moving. The rear lights are pretty cool as well. This thing in the middle here is actually your third brake light and then of course your standard indicators and stuff. But I love the design. They took it right off of the Vantage, which means at nighttime, you look like you're driving around in a lifted Aston Martin Vantage. And lastly, in the back, there is no DBX badge. It only says Aston Martin. And I think they've done that to try and stick with this minimalist trend that I've seen all over the DBX so far. But either way, I'll still try and come up with a funny acronym like I normally do. I had to think outside the box, but I came up with don't bother crossing the Aston Martin DBX or you're going to get absolutely annihilated. Opening up the back of the Aston Martin, there's a couple of surprises waiting for you. First and foremost, you can actually use it. I think this is the first ever usable Aston Martin back end. This button right here is straight out of a Mercedes. If you own one, you'll probably recognize it. This is the reversing camera. They've done a fantastic job of hiding them all throughout the car. And then if I go ahead and take a seat on my right hand side, if I hit this button, I'm gonna go down a little bit. In fact, there is 50 millimeters of travel down and 45 up on the air suspension for a grand total of 95 millimeters, which is fantastic. On my left hand side, if I press either of these, it'll fold the back seats down. There's even these lovely hooks in the back so you can tie your stuff down and still drive this car the way it's meant to be. As for on the side, check this out. This vent is actually functional. It's there for reason, not just looks once again. You see in the trend with the DBX, everything has a reason and I love that. It tunnels all the way down along with the glass going all the way down. So this is not just some cheap plastic that you'll find on some cars. They wanted to make sure the glass went all the way to the back of the car via the windows here. And these are massive 22 inch rims. And the brakes in the front are 410 millimeters with six piston brake calipers. And Aston Martin worked with Pirelli to develop three sets of tires for the DBX all season, summer, and winter, with these of course being on the winter.
And of course, nowadays, it wouldn't be a cool car if it didn't also have funky door handles. This has gone for the flush door handles. You just push in one side, grab the other. The window will, of course, open because they are frameless, and then you can get in. But I want to touch on the key fob. It, of course, is your normal key fob with lock, unlock, and to open the back. But if you flip it over, there's a little button, and inside, you'll find this spare key. Now, if you want to use this, open up the handle, and you'll find the slot to use it. But lastly, if you don't want your key fob attached to anything, you can also push it all the way in. As for the interior of the DBX, it's easy to bond with thanks to Aston's killer attention to detail. Besides all the recognizable features like the heated leather seats and steering wheel, multi-zone automatic climate control, sliding armrests, and a frameless rear view mirror, it has leather covered speakers, an Alcantara roof liner including the sunroof blind, lights activated by a simple touch, a dual visor setup, an open compartment for your phone, small bags, and anything else you want to store away and the start button will glow red when you put your foot on the brake before starting it. Now since the electronics are almost entirely Mercedes like the infotainment system it also has their 64 color ambient lighting that I go over in more detail in my Mercedes A250 review. As for the wipers if the aerodynamics of the DBX don't do the job and you use them after a couple seconds of being turned off they will slide even lower to help ease the airflow. I'll also be surprised if you can find any cheap plastics inside. Even the metal air vents are cold to the touch. Lastly, a fun easter egg that pays homage to their history and James Bond's classic car is the use of a simple DB5 symbol whenever possible from the gauge cluster to the infotainment system. As for the back, while this isn't a full-size SUV, it still feels spacious thanks to the massive open glass roof that is really only enjoyed to the fullest if you're in the back. There's there's also a third zone of climate control in the back as well as heated seats, an acceptable level of legroom, and one of my favorites, the fancy Alcantara O crap handles which if I'm being honest in this SUV I'm going to much more appropriately call the holy f handles. If you look carefully, you'll see all four doors are on swan hinges, meaning they open up a little bit. Which, just like so many other parts of this car, like the door handles, were once again inspired by the Vantage. I was surprised to find out that the DBX brochure, if you even want to call it that, has been made as a hardcover book, when for other cars, they just look like this. It mentions David Brown who used to own Aston Martin and explains how he first thought of having a luxury SUV made in the 50s. Only now 70 years later is it coming to life. And the DB in DBX being an abbreviation of his name. Now just before I take it out to let you know how the DBX drives, I promised a couple of very prestigious clients of mine that I would take them out for a spin. Here we go sir, just gonna strap you in. Alright guys. Well, it turns out that the Aston Martin DBX is so powerful that it can in fact rip heads off. And I don't think that CPR is gonna be able to fix this. Now that I have uh, humanely disposed of the remains, I can get right into talking about how the DBX actually drives. And let's just say this is not gonna be the SUV of choice when you're planning on driving around the block to put your baby to sleep. It can definitely be a bit intimidating at first, but once you learn what all the buttons and knobs do, this feels very familiar. I'm just driving an SUV with an Aston Martin badge. Everything feels very familiar and finely tuned, even the steering, which yes, it's an SUV, it has the weight and the height working against it, but they've done a brilliant job at hiding that. The ride is fantastic as well. When I go over a bump, it feels like an SUV. It absorbs it very well with all that suspension travel, but then I'll go in a straight line on a very smooth road and I feel like I'm in a sports car so you get the best of both worlds. As for fuel economy, I have an 87 liter tank in the DBX and let's just say that it doesn't always feel like it's that big. However, it depends how you drive it. Aston says that it gets 14.3 liters to the 100 kilometers, but you can easily get up to over 20 liters to the 100 kilometers if you drove it hard enough. Speaking of which, my favorite mode to put it in is Sport Plus. For obvious reasons, it's the one that brings the DBX most alive. It 
It's designed to maximize fun and minimize how long your tank of fuel lasts. There is also sport mode and individual, which is customizable, and of course, terrain and terrain plus. And if you're planning on buying a DBX and taking it off road, then kudos to you because you are one very confident and or ballsy individual. And I say that because this is quite a pricey SUV and if something goes wrong, it wouldn't be very nice to your pocket. Now, the price of the one that I'm driving is actually very satisfying. It's almost bang on a quarter million dollars Canadian. It is $250,079. The base price here in Canada being in the low 200s and then in US dollars, the base price is just under 193,000. But again, if you're planning on taking a DBX off road, you are going to have yourself an absolute blast if it drives anything like the Lamborghini Urus, which I have taken off road. I can speak to the Lamborghini Urus's air suspension and this thing has a very, very similar design. Now, while it is one in a million, things do go wrong and I can speak from personal experience. When I was at the Urus off road event, there was another individual that took their SUV up the trail and when they came down, they noticed that they had a puncture in the sidewall. It was nobody's fault. It wasn't the end of the world and there were a ton of mechanics around to fix the problem, but things do go wrong and all of these super SUVs have these space saving spares, which means that you're going to have to inflate it and you're going to have to put in a lot of extra work if you do get a flat tire and that doesn't apply to just off-roading. But back to the modes and there is one more that I want to touch on. Outside of Sport Plus, this is the only one that I really use. Of course, Sport Plus is just screaming at you all the time, but if I put it into GT, which is the mode that the car will start in, if you want to think of it as like your comfort and like your most economical mode. I mean, the only eco mode on here is your foot. But when I'm in GT, the best part about this is now, <clears throat> I can whisper and you can understand everything that I'm saying because it's very quiet inside of here now. The only thing to tell me that I'm in a very nice SUV is all the lovely materials around me. Of course, as you'd expect, there are a number of high-end safety and driver assistance features on board the DBX. Just to name a few, there is a park assist and a lane keep assist. Now, I think they're all fantastic features, but just to me, they're more or less party tricks. I just turn all of them off. I never use the park assist. I don't want anything helping me because to me, the DBX is a through and through driver's car. It's an SUV, but it's still an Aston Martin. I'm not in a Rolls Royce or a Bentley. I don't need a chauffeur to drive me around or a computer to tell me what to do or do it for me. I want to do this myself, especially since in about 10 years, what, 2030, I think, England said no more gasoline powered or diesel engines. It's just going to be electric cars that probably drive themselves around and I actually want these 10 years to drive cars. However, there is one driver assistance feature that I do leave turned on and that is the speed limit reminder. It's very helpful because this is a car that does not ever want to go the speed limit even in GT mode. So it's very nice to know what you're supposed to be going if you missed the sign because whatever you're going, you get about half that and that's how you feel. So if I'm going 100, I feel like I'm going 50. It's bizarre because I look at the gauge cluster and I see that it goes up to 330 kilometers per hour. So the actual top speed of this is 181 miles per hour or 291 kilometers per hour. So not quite 330, but it's hilarious seeing that on there. And it's also sort of trippy because when I'm just going your standard 80 kilometers per hour down the road, I look down and if I don't have the number displayed and instead I'm looking at where the needle is, it's still pretty much at the bottom. Now, because paddle shift are different on pretty much every single vehicle. What are they like on the DBX and how do they work? Well, first of all, they're mounted on the steering column. That's important. I always know where to find them when I want to upshift or downshift. They're not mounted on the steering wheel. There's so much more room in an SUV so they can get away with something like that. The second thing is they're not mucking about with the materials. I would like to know, do your paddle shifters make this sound? That to me is just it's quality, you can't beat that. When it comes to actually using them, as soon as I upshift, it's going to give me full control and it's not gonna take it back until I ask it to. It'll give me a suggestion with a little arrow saying upshift or downshift, but it's not gonna take over like some other cars do if it thinks you're not using it properly. Now, if I wanted to put it back into automatic, I just have to hold the up paddle 
and I'm back in automatic. Now the only thing left to do is mash my foot, takes a second for the turbos, and then it really gets going, but that's where launch control comes into play. Zero to 60 miles per hour in 4.3 seconds, zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.5 seconds, zero to 100 miles per hour in 10 seconds, and a quarter mile done in 11.7. Now keep in mind that this is not your standard launch control system. It technically doesn't have one, so we, like James Bond, do it the old fashioned way, darling. Left foot on the brake, right foot on the accelerator, let the revs build up, left foot off the brake, and no more turbo leg, holy moly. The crazy part is I'm being pushed into the seats of an Aston Martin SUV. I love this bend here. The DBX corners like it is on rails. And if a metaphor isn't good enough for you, then you should check out how I set up my camera. I usually just clamp my camera on a tripod between the passenger seat and the glove box, but for the first time ever, that just wasn't enough. I think that Aston Martin has put some spell on the DBX, some witchcraft, because even with all the fancy electronics and adaptive dampers, an SUV should just not be able to corner like that at those speeds. Now. Getting into the pros and cons, starting off with the pros, there is one big thing that the DBX has going for it. Most of its competition from the likes of Lamborghini, Bentley, Porsche, Audi, and all the rest are all based on the same platform. But Aston Martin gave the DBX an all new chassis. In fact, it is the newest chassis for an SUV since the debut of the Model X back in 2015. It's kind of like if I was to go on a diet and change my clothes. I still have the same bone structure and that's what's going on here. The DBX in that regards is an entirely different person and that's why this is so important because the rest of its competition is using the same bone structure or chassis if you will and that means that Aston Martin can do things differently. Just as an example they've given the DBX a longer wheelbase to give it a more hunkered down sporty feel as a proper Aston Martin should. And trust me I get it why would you go and build something just a little bit differently if somebody else has already perfected it and that's the mentality of these other brands and that's fine but Aston Martin was not going to jump on that bandwagon they wanted to design something just a little bit different and in fact it almost bankrupt them for the eighth time realistically the next company to release a super SUV now will have to be Ferrari who have said they have plans for one in 2022 the extra time and money that was spent by Aston Martin on the DBX has really paid off to create something that is special and unique but the chassis isn't the only pro the second biggest thing for me is is that the DBX comes with all of the good stuff in the base price, unlike so many of its competitors. And I mean all of the good stuff, all the extras, which there are plenty of, and packages. That's just stuff that not everybody would want. For example, ventilated seats. Here in Calgary, we really just need heated seats for the winters. I don't think I'd ever use ventilated seats. So what is it that I don't like about the DBX? I had to do some hunting, but I did find a couple of things. It is getting launched with an outdated info attainment system. Mercedes has already released a newer version that didn't make it into this. Plus, it isn't even a touchscreen. You have to get used to the touchpad and dial, which has gotten easier to use as time has gone on, but I think that it's silly that they ask us to reach up to use the classic Aston selectors, but yet I can't use this as a touchscreen. Secondly, the roof doesn't open. While it's a lovely standard feature, that alone will make it or break it for some people. And the same goes for the privacy cover in the back. It's lovely, but there's no Nowhere to store it if you don't want it. And I'm not 100% sure why they've done this, but the vanity mirror is barely big enough to check to make sure that your eyebrows are still stuck on your face after driving the DBX. Now it is all-wheel drive, but there is no four-wheel steering like some of its competitors have. And I also think that the key fob holder is a bit silly. The whole point of a fob is that it stays in your pocket, and if you do take them out, they're usually going to be attached to all your other keys, and that won't fit either. But just on the off chance that you do take the fob off and you do put it in the holder it doesn't even fit properly so what I've done is because there's no obvious place to put your sunglasses I've turned it into my shades holder and there is no remote start or USB type C on board the DBX but you can find them on vehicles that cost less than 20% of the price and lastly even though this looks like a wireless phone charger it sadly isn't and again can be found on cars that cost a fraction of the price but I'm happy to report that it's okay. If those small imperfections really bother you that much, then there is a solution for you built in to the Aston Martin. All you need to do is once you get going, pop her into 
Sport Plus. Mash your foot, all your stresses go away. <laughs> so yes, to some degree it is a dressed up Mercedes GLC 63, and no, it doesn't look as cool as the concept. I don't think 007 will be driving a DBX in place of his classic DB5 in a Bond movie anytime soon. But, there's a reason that it's been voted as the best designed car of the year. People like you and I see past the nuts and bolts that hold each car together. We know that each one is alive and has its own personality, and that's what non-car people don't get. To them, I'd make a joke about how this is the iPhone of the car world, and not just because both brands ditched numbers for the letter X at the end, but to me, this is something more. It satisfies every ounce of my being, going all the way back to when I was growing up in England and wanted nothing more than to just have fun riding around on a set of wheels right through to the winter-loving Canadian I've become. There are cheaper and quicker options out there, but Aston has never cared about the numbers because a good car is capable of one thing like going fast, conquering off-road trails, towing, or drifting. But a great car has been beautifully balanced to do it all, coming together to create a new experience around every corner. It's polite, that is until you drop your right foot. Then it becomes the first car I've ever reviewed that I turned down my own music because there is a far nicer soundtrack coming from the car itself. It's been engineered by Germans, built by the British, and tested by Mother Nature. And if you don't like that, it's fine, but you're wrong. So then, apart from diehard Aston Martin fans who want an SUV and have a quarter million dollars to spend on one, who should buy the 2021 Aston Martin DBX? Well, for those of you who are looking around in the super SUV world, this is the one for you if you're looking for an SUV that is the perfect balance between being high class and utterly exhilarating. If a martini and a roller coaster decided to procreate, you would get the DBX and the level of comfort will also appeal to older buyers. Oh, oh, oh. oh yes. And in this price range, you're still getting one of the best handling options that was designed to be a driver's car. And that means that I can happily say that even though they've changed the recipe a little bit, this is still through and through an Aston Martin. Holy moly. <laughs> What's up guys? Even Mother Nature wants to check out the DBX, and those deer were not the first encounter I've had with wildlife today with this car. Earlier on, as an Aston Martin driver does, I was enjoying some afternoon tea, and I looked out the window and noticed this little fella checking out the DBX as well. I think he wanted to hitch a ride, so there's your answer. Get the DBX if you're a tree hugger, nature lover, deer hunter, bird watcher, and all the rest. Anyway, that's that is everything that you need to know about the brand new 2021 Aston Martin DBX. A massive, massive thank you to everyone who made this possible. I have linked the websites to both Distinctive Collection and Azeridge in the description below. I would love to hear what your thoughts are in the comments. Of course, if you're new here, feel free to subscribe. And lastly, if you enjoyed this video, drop a like, and if you didn't, drop a dislike. And once again, my name is Thomas. I will definitely be crying myself to sleep tonight after I give the DBX back, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Oh yeah, this guy's into it. This guy's into it.